Hi, I'm Ian Myers, and I'm here with my colleague. Cost of dollars, Dr. Chi Chang from Melbourne. Hi, Ian. I thought I'd take the opportunity while I'm, well, we're here to talk a little bit about resin bonding, um, adhesive bonding, and particularly, where are we in 2016 with adhesive bonding? Well, Ian, I think in 2016, bonding in general has become a very, very big part of everyday dentistry. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Well, the first reason is that it works. We know, and we have known for a long time now, that we can get a really good, predictable, and durable bond to enamel. But the question really in 2016 is that can we do the same with dentine? And I think that there are steps being taken in the right direction by the companies, by researchers and clinicians to get us to that point where we can get that same predictability and durability. So is it all about mechanical bonding or are we looking at other things? Well, it is, yes, still for enamel. And that's the reason why it has been so successful. I mean, if you look at enamel as a structure, it's about 95% hydroxyapatite. It's very inert inorganic, very, very little moisture in the whole thing. So we can actually get a very good micromechanical lock by etching the enamel to get that resin to lock in. Now, with dentine, we have tried that and it has worked to some degree in the past through the concept of the hybrid layer. Mm -hmm. But we now know that there are problems with the hybrid layer. So now the focus is shifting more towards chemical adhesion to the dentine rather than just purely relying on a micromechanical interlock. So is it then not all about the collagen? Um, well, collagen is a big part of it because what happens with the way we traditionally bond to dentine or we have bonded to dentine is through the concept called the hybrid layer. Yeah. And the hybrid layer essentially is this mix between the dentine, which is primarily, uh, well, let me rephrase that. So dentine is about 40 to 45% hydroxyapatite, a mineral. Collagen is about 25% of that and the rest of it's mm -hmm. water. So there is a big component of collagen and dentine. So with the hybrid layer, what we do is we etch out all of the hydroxyapatite and we're left with just this collagen network. Yeah. And with hybrid layer, what we're doing is we're trying to get the resin impregnated into that collagen network to literally form a hybrid, a mix between the collagen and the resin. Mm -hmm. So that's how we get that mechanical interlock. So there have been issues about, you know, is it all about that collagen breaking down? It sounds a bit ominous now if we're going to rely on that. Yeah, so what's happened in the last decade or so is that there's been quite a bit of evidence both from the laboratory and clinically that that hybrid layer is susceptible to breakdown. So you mentioned the collagen. So the first thing that can happen, and it has been shown both experimentally and clinically, is that there are some enzymes within the tooth structure itself that get released to eat away at the collagen. So if you think about the collagen and the resin being this sort of uh, layer where they both depend on each other, first part is if the collagen breaks down because of this enzyme action, mm -hmm. then you're gonna get a breakdown of the, uh, of the uh, hybrid layer. The second thing which uh, is also a problem, and we also know this, is that the resin component in that hybrid layer can break down as well. So in the presence of water, mm -hmm. that resin can hydrolyze and it can both break down. So you have this hybrid layer being attacked from two points, basically. So there are some issues with it. So while it has worked on, and it continues to work, we now know that there are issues with it. And so the durability issue that I was talking about is now coming to the fore in terms of where the research is going. Yeah, but we aren't seeing all of our restorations falling out. You'd think that with all this ominous stuff, you'd think all those should be falling out. Well, no, you're absolutely right. And, and, and we're not. So we don't have to lose any sleep. You know, that's true. Um, and I think. Part of that is, you know, we have discovered ways and we have developed ways over the last three or four decades to basically try and get that hybrid layer to work and work well. But I think a big part of it as well, as a lot of people talk about, is having that peripheral rim of enamel to bond to. Mm -hmm. We always focus on enamel bonding being the key to the success of our restorations. And so for a lot of our restorations, we do have some enamel we can bond to. But there are some, as you know, that we can't. Mm -hmm. For example, like class five lesions, etc. Mm -hmm. So the focus really should be trying to target those particular clinical scenarios and trying to improve uh, our bond to those. All right, so, uh, so with the dentine, there. how important is, is the hydroxyapatite in the dentine? Very important, very important. So we go back again to that con concept of the hybrid layer. When we etch, you know, we use our phosphoric acid to etch the, um, the dentine, what we actually do is we remove all of the hydroxyapatite to try to get more space for the resin to get into. And this, again, that, that concept works. but hydroxyapatite has two main um, benefits if we try and preserve it in the dentine. And the first mm -hmm. one is that having that mineral content will then allow us to form that chemical bond. We talked about chemical yeah, bonding sure. at the yeah. start. The second benefit of having the hydroxyapatite is it actually protects the collagen itself. And remember when I said the collagen is susceptible to being degraded through these enzymes. Sure. If you have hydroxyapatite around the collagen, then the enzymes aren't able to get to the collagen, okay. so it basically holds the structure together. Okay, so I mean a lot of 
bonding agents contain HEMA on the basis that they ah. are going to penetrate into that structure. Yes, correct. So is HEMA a good thing or a bad thing for resin bonding? Well, traditionally it has been seen as a good thing. So HEMA is um, used in two ways, I guess, when we talk mm -hmm. about dentine bonding. The first way is that when we etch the dentine and we're left with this collagen matrix, remember, hydroxyapatite's gone. We still have only about 30% of the collagen there. So the rest of that actually is, is water. Mm. So you look at it by volume, you've got now 70% of that complex is water, 30% is uh, collagen. So we need something that's able to penetrate into that moist, wet structure to draw the residents in, and that's the HEMA. So HEMA is known as a hydrophilic monomer. The second reason we have HEMA is because those little bottles that we have with our bonds, they have solvents in them, and a very common solvent is water. And so we need something to uh, enable the whole thing to mix together in that bottle so that we can actually use it clinically. Now, remember what I said at the start though, water is a problem yeah, with dentine bonding yeah. because it hydrolyzes and it breaks resin down. So while HEMA is a good thing if you're trying to get this hybrid layer, if we're thinking about the big picture in the long term, having something there that is going to naturally attract water and allow water to go in mm. is probably a bad thing because it's actually going to enhance or it's going to, it's going to uh, enable that resin bond to be broken down. So we get, again, degradation. So would you think it's better to have a HEMA-free bonding agent? For example, do you use a HEMA-free bonding agent? Yeah, and, and, and uh, no, it's not just me. There's a lot of companies now that are coming out with HEMA-free formulations because a lot of researchers and companies are now seeing uh, the detrimental effects of having uh, HEMA in their bonding okay. agents. And I'm, I, I'm, I certainly use one. Uh, I use multiple bonds for, for uh, reasons mm -hmm. I won't get into this morning, but certainly for me, one of the ones that I'm using a lot more now is, is uh, a product by GC called G Premio Bond, which is an evolution of their initial early bonds. Before that came Genial Bond and before that came G Bond. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and certainly what GC have done with their bonding strategy is to go away from HEMA more towards a chemical bonding. So eliminating HEMA from the, the mix will basically reduce the risk of that hydrolysis and, uh, and then put the focus more on the chemical adhesion side. Okay, so uh, from my understanding, G Premio Bond is one of the newer universal adhesives. Yes, It's got all right. sorts of things it can do. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, so universal adhesives or universal bonds are, I guess, the, the, the latest generation, if you will, uh, of bonding agents available. And uh, there's two ways that, that we can consider these bonds to be universal. The first one is that within the bonds themselves, they have this, um, these monomers, basically. And these monomers are what forms that chemical bond to tooth structure. But these same monomers can also form a bond to our indirect uh, restorative materials, such as uh, metals, both precious and non-precious, mm -hmm. um, and our ceramics, such as uh, zirconia. Some of the companies will have a bond that can bond to, um, to glass ceramics, like lithium mm -hmm. silicate, but not G Premio bond. Okay, so it's got a phosphate monomer bonding system to bond to zirconia. Correct. But it doesn't directly bond to a lithium disilicate. So yeah. how would I go about bonding a lithium disilicate if I'm using G Premio bond? Okay, so you'd have to use a separate primer. Um, GC make a very nice one called uh, G Multi Primer, which yeah. basically will have silane in it to form, uh, to form that chemical bond to those glass ceramics such as lithium disilicate. Mm -hmm. And I have heard that placing silane primers in an acidic bottle may not be the most stable way of, of having a macular. Yeah, so silane chemistry is actually very complex. Um, and obviously there are companies that will include silane into their universal adhesives. But from my understanding, and it sounds like you have the same understanding, those adhesives are inherently going to be slightly acidic because that's how mm -hmm. we're going to get that sort of mild etching uh, phenomenon onto the dentine, which we still want, by the way. But in those acidic conditions, what can happen is that the silane can get activated and essentially used up. It'll cross-link with, its, uh, with itself. And so with time, the silane all gets used up and essentially gets deactivated. So the chemistry can be quite complex. And, and I know that there are chem uh, chemists and companies out there who do add silane into the mix, but I'm a bit skeptical about that. And I do wonder, you know, is that going to really stand the test of time? Mm -hmm. So for me personally, even if I were to use one of those other bonds, I would still prefer to use a separate silane uh, bonding agent on my glass ceramics and my lithium yeah. silicates. Okay, great. So with the new universal bonds, are we still back to the hybrid layer concept then? No, we're not. So with the universal bonds, the focus very much is on chemical bonding. Now, there's this, as I said to you, there's two ways that G Premier bond and universal bonds can be considered um, universal. And the first one I mentioned is being able to bond to indirect substrates. The second reason that they can be considered universal is because they're what we know, are what we call multi-mode adhesives. And what I mean by multi-mode adhesives is that 
we can use them in a way that uh, we traditionally note, i.e. total mm -hmm. etch, so we can get a phosphoric acid and we etch it, or preferably we're now doing uh, self etching. And then there's that sort of in-between one where we can use um, just the etch on the enamel and uh, do what we call selective etching. So there's three modes that we can use yeah, these okay. adhesives on, so G Premium Bond especially fits into that. So the first problem is, well, number one, self etching of dentine is good because as I've said this morning, we don't want to etch away all of the, um, the hydroxyapatite. We want to leave some sure. in there, so by reducing the acidity, by having something that's a bit milder, we're going to preserve that. Now the problem with the enamel though is that we do want to etch it, we do want to roughen it. So these soft etching agents, G Premium Bonds on its own, is not really enough to get a good um, etching pattern on the enamel. And so sure. that micromechanical lock to enamel, which is again what we want, is not going to be as good if we just mm. use it in the soft etch mode. So we total etch, sorry, we, we select the etch. Yeah. Now, the problem though is that sometimes, as you know, clinically, it's hard to find that demarcation like, yeah. <laughs> where the enamel f f yeah. uh, you know, finishes and where the dentine starts. Yeah, so yeah. you might accidentally etch, etch a bit the dentine, of the dentine yeah. right? So traditionally, if we look at some of the other brands or other self-etching primers, when you accidentally etch dentine and you put this self-etching primer on, we can get problems. Essentially, we're over-etching the dentine. We can get problems like leakage. We can get problems sure. like uh, sensitivity, etc. Now, with these universal bonds, there are studies now that, sh uh, that show that even if you accidentally or inadvertently did um, etch the dentine, we still form that nice good bond. And in the case of etching the dentine, we actually formed this hybrid layer. Mm -hmm. So we're going back to the older principle. So okay. you and I can rest easy knowing that if we accidentally etch yeah, the dentine, right. we're still going to get the restoration sticking in. However, it's not going to be the ideal. So my preference will still be to self-etch the dentine, etch the enamel, and to, um, and to get that. Yeah, so that selective edge check technique seems to work. Uh, so it's good to know that you know the, the newer universal agents tend to be a little bit more forgiving, a bit more user yes, friendly. Yes, that's right. But Absolutely. still adaptable enough to meet the various practitioner requirements. That's right, yeah. And ultimately, you know, in dentistry, what we really want is to, to keep things simple and uh, you know, keep our stress levels down. And we, we do a very stressful job, so it mm -hmm. would be good to have something out there that does make our, our job not only easier, but also uh, it seems to be the better way to go. And yeah, more predictable. And yeah, more great. predictable, definitely. Look, thanks, Chi. That's been brilliant. I really appreciate that. I'm sure you've clarified a lot of issues. I look forward yeah. to hearing more presentations by you on this in the future. So thanks yeah. very much. Uh, thank you.